We are live here on Invent FM. Rachel, how are you doing? I'm well. How are you? I am great. Thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join me today. Um, fun fun fact, uh, Rachel is calling in from, from, in your words, tomorrow. Uh, I am. I'm calling what, from the future. <laughs> calling from the future. Where Where are you right now? I am over the international date line in Auckland, New Zealand. Wow. Very lucky to be here. That's amazing. That's awesome. I am jealous. Uh, <laughs> tomorrow looks very beautiful. I can say <laughs> it's, it's dawning, sunny, and lovely. That's awesome. So thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, we're going to spend a lot of time uh, with Rachel learning about the Rosalia project and learning about her invention of the Cora Ball and her mission uh, for safer and cleaner oceans. Uh, and before we get into that, I wanted to uh, start, Rachel, by uh, asking you for a little bit of help because I'm trying to figure out what invention is. And the part of the mission of this show is to to learn from lots of different uh, inventors uh, of various types, some of whom don't even necessarily even self-identify with the term. But um, I guess I'm curious to to ask you, like, I guess, do you consider yourself an inventor? I I did put it in my bio kind of recently. Okay. But I definitely don't bring it up in like a cocktail party, except it. It, not as a singular. I okay. think because our situation was very much a team effort. Okay. Co if I do, it's in the context of we we make something to protect the ocean from microfiber pollution rather than going down the like specific road of like I or we invented a thing, but we did invent a thing. So the reality is, is that. That yes. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So what, what does invention mean to you then? For me, invention is problem solving a problem solving a problem in a new unique way okay. so that i think that would be the simplest way i would describe invention i don't think it means that it has to all be coming from thin air i think invention can use cues and ideas from other things that exist but mm -hmm. something that is invented as opposed to just done I think that it, there is some level of uniqueness to an invention as opposed to just a thing that you use. Got it. For technique. So quick, uh, quick, can you, can you invent something that's already been invented? Can you, what does that mean? That's an excellent question. So we generally call that redesign. Okay. Rather than like True invention. invention or like innovation. Um, but it's close. It's, it's, yeah, I think no wonder I, I get that you're kind of working on it and you're not like, this is not, here's invention. I completely understand that. I, I suppose you can reinvent something, but then it's a unique thing. You're just doing it better. You're solving a problem because whatever it is that you reinvented didn't do the whole, didn't solve the whole problem that you wanted. So yeah. it's, it's still an invention. It's just maybe a tweaked one. I know it's tough. This is tough. Yeah. Now that you've well, asked, <laughs> well, that's awesome. No, and I one of the things I I was just thinking about uh, as you were saying this of like, it's got to be new. It's got to solve a problem. Is kind of one of the ways that I've, you know, quote unquote, practiced inventing is you know thinking I invented something, you know, as a graduate student or something. And and in fact, in one in one case, I even. Uh, filed a provisional patent. I was like, yeah, this is amazing. I invented this thing, filed a provisional patent. And then in the year, you know, gap that you have um, yeah. between the, the provisional and the full, I, I realized 
<laughs> this was invented 30 years ago and I, didn't, I just didn't know that uh, that this existed. I, you know, I hadn't read enough. Um, that brings up uh, such a good issue of invention. Can you, in your, if you invented it just in your world, because the thing doesn't exist. In, I mean, that thing didn't exist in your world. It exists right. in the world. Right. Is it still an invention? I guess it depends on how big you're looking and what you want to do with it. <laughs> yeah. that's amazing point. that's amazing <laughs> cool so so rachel i'd love you have a, a fantastic presentation for us to tell us a little bit about uh this this big problem that you've seen directly with your own eyes and and uh felt with your own hands uh and then we're gonna learn a little bit about your process of saying enough is enough. I want to do something about it. Absolutely. So would you be ready to, to load up the slides and tell us about Rosalia? I'm ready. Okay. You're looking at a big, beautiful research vessel right there. I see a big, beautiful research vessel that says Rosalia Project for a Clean Ocean. So what Perfect. is that? Perfect. So to understand the invention part of this story, I think it is important to get a little bit of foundation for the catalyst of all of this. So the real catalyst on the way, way back is that I'm a water person and I'm really not very good on land, like uh -huh. kind of clumsy and scary walking yeah, around. But I love the water. Yeah. That's what my, my, I don't eat fish. My mom used to say it's because they're my friends when I was little and no one could explain why I didn't eat fish as a tiny kid. But, that's, that's but um, so, so Rosalia Project is a nonprofit that my husband and I founded 11 years ago now, and it is dedicated to working, uh, well, to protecting the ocean. That is our overarching goal. But we've been specifically working on the problem of marine debris. And so within that, we work on derelict fishing gear, consumer debris, and microplastic. But the, just the quick definition of Rosalia Project, so kind of know where we come from and what sets us apart from other marine debris organizations is that we approach the problem of marine debris with four strategies. 75% are solutions oriented. So the first is that we do cleanups. So that's the stuff that's already there. If all we all did were cleanups, we'd never stop the problem, but we add an element of data collection during our cleanup. So that's even solution oriented. And then the other strategies are prevention through education. So programs, we are embracers of innovation and technology, which is a lot of how the core ball came to exist. And we do solutions based research. We do all that in coastal and urban waters because we believe that the because the majority of this problem comes from the land sea interface, we are believers in that it is more cost effective and efficient to work at the land sea interface at the source of the problem mm -hmm. and the whole water column. So from the surface to sea floor that we generally operate from this beautiful sailing oceanographic research vessel, American Promise. And we have an underwater robot, an, R an ROV, a remotely operated vehicle we call Hector the Collector to help us get underwater without throwing anybody overboard. And obviously shoreline is accessible. That's so, awesome. so sorry, just so, I, just so I understand um, yeah. the distinction uh, and to clarify for the audience, then something like the Great Pacific Trash Dryer would not be a, it's not that you don't care about it, but it's not a focal point for your work because it's not close enough to the coast. Is that correct? That's correct. We appreciate all of the science that has happened across our ocean, our one big global ocean. Got it. And we uh, acknowledge that if you're a little thing that can't swim, that you, especially if you're plastic, <laughs> you will break down in the sunlight and the forces of the ocean and eventually get sucked into these circulating patterns that happen whether there's trash or not, the big gyres. Yeah. And if you can't swim, you kind of could end up in the middle of there. And so these accumulation zones, 
one of which is called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch is one in every ocean. Oh, there we uh, go. That's the technical term. Garbage. Yeah, yeah. They exist. It's important that we know about them in order to conclude for at least our group mm -hmm. that getting that stuff before it becomes tiny little bleached out bits of plastic, before it gets that far, it is easier to pick up an entire water bottle. Yeah. Here, I, got, I got a little question for you. How many pieces of one millimeter microplastic do you think a kind of standard sized um, single use beverage bottle would be? So one millimeter is pretty big in the world of microplastic, which yeah. is five millimeters and under. Oh man, this is like a, this is one of those like McKinsey, you want a job at McKinsey? Or, <laughs> <laughs> all falls from the 747. How about uh, 10,000? How many? 10,000. More. 100,000. Okay, 39,000. 30, so, all right. I was yeah. in the right order of magnitude. You, you were right close. Right you were. <laughs> <laughs> so if you think about it, 39,000 pieces of what well, basically pinheads are difficult to recover if you can just keep that one water bottle out of the ocean in the first place. So for me, that kind of sums up why Absolutely. one of the reasons our work is at the land-sea interface rather yeah. than in thousands of miles away in the center of our oceanic gyres. Okay. Yeah. So, um, okay, so Rosalia Project, uh, we do all these programs. So any of our expeditions or programs draw from the cleanup education, technology and research and, and use them in combinations. And in the course of our work, we learned about the problem of microfiber pollution in around 2013. We did not discover it. That was discovered, it came out of the uh, Plymouth uh, University lab in the UK uh, around 2011. And it, it just they didn't really, um, it, it didn't get covered a ton in the beginning. And we learned about it in 2013, it was still really early. And this was a problem, and I know you get this, it just screamed at us, this problem. It didn't just like speak to us a little bit, it screamed at us. We thought, oh my God, this is, of course, our clothes are falling apart. And they, those, you know, they go threadbare. We've all seen clothes go threadbare, but we never thought about where those threads go or yep. how that actually works. And so when we heard about it, we, we just, it was just one of those things. And so we set out to do three things. One, we wanted to see if we could come up with a way to stop this from happening. So a solution, we didn't know where in the continuum our solution would be when we first were like, ah, this problem. So come up with a solution. We wanted to uh, contribute to the then very scant knowledge, scientific knowledge about the problem. Specifically, our first question was, what does microfiber look like in the wild? And I'll, I'll talk just a little bit about that. And our third goal was to spread the word because we wanted other people to feel, other people with more expertise than us and in other industries, upstream and downstream of consumers to feel the same way and to apply their energy and expertise to the problem. So people in textile manufacturing or extrusion, weaving, laundry machines, that kind of thing, as well as just people who wear and wash clothes. Uh, so those were our three goals. Wow. All right, you ready to see what the problem looks like when- sure. I'm ready to dive in. And I guess I just want to, right before we dive in, I just want to say for, for those that are joining us live, uh, if you have questions uh, during this, feel free to put them in the question and answer box. Uh, we'll probably get to most of them towards the end, but obviously we want people engaged while they're thinking about this. If you have a question now, uh, instead of the chat, use the Q and A box. But okay, Rachel, let's let's dive I, in. And... Have you ever seen microfiber pollution? It's hard to see because the micro part is for real. Uh, I I can't say that I've really seen it no. live. I think maybe the closest opportunity that I could have had to see it would be in Bali, where I was kind of, you know, the Indonesian, uh, what is it, the sea, it's not even an ocean, right? Indonesian sea is very shallow. So there's, um, you know, in this beautiful landscape, there's, you know, kind of trash everywhere. But no, I, the micro size, I think I'm not uh, no, good enough or uh, eye open enough scuba diver to have noticed. 
I don't think you'd see it as a scuba diver with the naked eye, especially just kind of swimming around the ocean, which doesn't mean it's not there. So okay. see it more easily. You need to go all the way back to the effluent, the water coming out of your washing machine. So we're going to right now focus on the washing machine part of this problem. It was the okay. initial, uh, that was kind of initial, the initial primary source of this pollution. And that's where we started working on it. So this is microfiber that washed out of our machine wow. in a typical winter load of laundry. This is just a tiny bit of it dried and magnified. Okay. So we collected all the water in buckets that came out of a load of wash and then put it through a series of sieves. So that's what it looks like. So now I'm just going to kind of set it up. Okay. These are pictures of our clothing magnified. So this is a super fun rabbit hole if you have a digital <laughs> microscope and it's uh, just super geeky fun to microscope your clothing. Um, I'll lay out there that this bottom left corner, the one where I, you can't see the writing, it's hard to see the writing in all of them, but uh, that's, I want you to guess the material. No one has ever guessed this material in any of my presentations. Uh, but what's interesting here is to think, okay, so our, we fundamentally know this, this is caused because our clothes are breaking, particularly in the wash. And those little tiny pieces of what were once longer fibers are washing out the drain and into our public waterways. That fundamentally is the problem okay. of microfiber pollution as it relates to washing machines. All right. Before I and, guess, yeah. can, I, I want I want to try to guess, but before I guess, okay. can you just tell me what's the magnification on the one on the bottom? Uh, these are all between uh, 40 and 80 times magnification. Huh. Okay. Yeah. I'm gonna, so, guess, I'm gonna guess yoga pants. That's the one next to it. So Whoa. yoga pants is a uh, bottom row, second from the left. So that is a spandex, nylon spandex, okay. uh, tight weave. Yeah, interesting, huh? So we've got acrylic, the yellow is acrylic. That is a very high shedding material. The next is woven polyester. And then like a fleecy, open weave polyester. You can see that looks like it's just ready to be broken. Mm -hmm. Cotton poly blend is next. That's a, like a pretty typical t-shirt weave or t-shirt blend. And you can see we have materials and then weaves. There's, it, I've learned a lot about textiles and how complicated it all is. Then there's the mystery, then yoga pants, then we've got a linen rayon mix and then 100% cotton. Okay. And I want to keep natural fibers in this conversation, naturally derived fibers, because they're not necessarily entirely off the hook. Okay, ready for what that is? That sure. is neoprene. That is black wetsuit under. Whoa. Yes, Whoa. isn't that beautiful and kind that of- really cool. I think so too. All right, so let's um, just look at the problem a little bit deeper here. So there's a fleece dress. We wear those in Vermont. There's fleece magnified. Now there have been a lot of studies um, one of the very first was commissioned by Patagonia itself. Just Patagonia, I really admire for front footing this problem. They kind of just said, all right, we make all these clothes, outdoor clothes. And so we're going to kind of investigate the, I think they said about to do something very similar to us is let's learn more about the problem and see if that information can help us stop it. So, uh, Bren School of Oceanography, at UC Santa Barbara did this very early study. They found that one fleece jacket could put over 81,000 pieces of microplastic or microfiber out the drain per garment per wash. Another study said up to nearly three quarters of a million pieces could wow. wash up of one garment per wash, just, just so you get the magnitude. And back then, and it's, this is only just starting to change now. This is all there's been on washing machines to stop anything from going out the drain. And you can see that these holes are really just meant to keep coins and Wedding. dollar bills. Yeah, exactly, from, from washing out. And so this is what we get. Okay, so now that's the definition. Here's why we care. There are two types of risks that microfiber pollution poses first to sea creatures and then we're trying to figure out if it does the same thing to us. 
So first on the physical side, picture yourself a tiny little grain of rice grain of rice sized plankton. So you're little and you have a little belly. So you in, ingest some of this microfiber. What's been found in lab experiments is that it can scratch your little esophagus uh, and um, other creatures as well. And it can also more, more appropriate with the plankton is fill your little plankton belly with something that isn't giving you any nutrition. Mm -hmm. And so you effectively can starve with a full belly or it just blocks your whole intestinal system. So, right. so that, it's kind of like the equivalent of, uh, what do they say? Don't give uh, the pigeons in bread. the bread because they can't actually break it down. Yeah, exactly. Like okay. creatures have evolved to very, like to effectively eat the stuff they can, they don't, they don't need our help. Right. <laughs> like it's, it's not helpful to them. Not helpful. So um, they don't need our fleece either. Well, they totally do not need to be ingesting our fleece. And then there's the chemical side. Now, some of these are inert in the water. Polyethylene, polypropylene, those just sitting in the water alone have not been shown to necessarily be dangerous. However, there are interesting uh, relationships going on between marine born plastics and the next bunch of things on this list, which are persistent organic pollutants, legacy chemicals, they're, they're in the ocean, but they're kind of by themselves. And what happens in the water is that these PCBs, uh, flame retardants, which are the PBDEs, they can what's called adsorb. So they stick to the outside of marine born plastics. And studies have shown that when creatures ingest this stuff, those uh, persistent organic pollutants can then desorb and they get transferred into the tissue, bloodstream, skin of the creatures that ingest them. And that's happening at different, lots of different species and types of creatures. At this point, I think the last literature review found over 200 creatures that have been ingesting plastic in a very uh, scientifically proven way. Uh, mm -hmm. And I just also want to bring up that there are chemicals associated with our textile industry that appear also on naturally derived textiles, like cotton or anything else, uh, like heavy metals associated with dye setting and things like optical brighteners and wrinkle, rele wrinkle releasers, which I didn't even know existed before we started working on this problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, but you're not taking a shot of wrinkle releaser. Like, it's not something we want to drink. And yet... There's evidence that this, this loss of material can be a vector to bring not only the material itself, the potential harm that microplastic period causes in the water, but also bring across some chemicals that weren't already there. So yeah. the reality is, is what's in the water is eaten by creatures, period. That should be enough for us to take action, to protect biodiversity and the marine food web. But the marine food web, as you know, is inextricably linked to the human food web. And there's been some studies that straight up just show that essentially what they eat, we eat. Uh, so uh, Chelsea Rockman at the University of Toronto did a study and they just straight up went and got fish from a fish market in California. So these aren't randomly caught fish. They were meant for our plates and they did find that one in three shellfish, one in four fin fish, and 67% of everything they looked at had microplastic, nearly entirely microfiber in them. Wow. So it's not just that sort of obvious fish, especially filter feeders that have microplastic, particularly microfiber. There's been studies, this was a report, so this one wasn't, peer, Chelsea's work was peer reviewed and published. This was self-published by Orb Media that looked at water sources, found tap water. This is percentage of samples that had microfiber not driving you to bottled water because it's just as bad. <laughs> so there's oh, no wow. like, un unintended consequence there to say, look at the tap waters. But it's and bottled there water. are, uh, what did we say? 37,000 pieces of <laughs> one millimeter. Oh yeah, yeah, there you go, 39,000. So not it's only just, are you not, is it not as pure as you think it is, but then you're creating the problem uh, again, over again. Yeah, it's a fascinating and, and, pile of 
plastic. <laughs> yeah, and one thing, one thing that I'll point out for people who are picky about uh, their water purity and uh, think that the bottled water is safer is all of those chemicals that you just mentioned on the other slide about you know phthalates and brighteners. Uh, well, guess what? <laughs> those are all additives that are included as you know, uh, ways of improving the clarity of the bottle yeah. that is molded, the, um, you know, the, and so you're, you know, you're drinking that <laughs> and when you dispose of it, you're putting that back into the cycle. So, wow, that's, re that's really uh, eye-opening. Thank you. Yeah, no, and it's great to talk to someone with your expertise as well to understand that. And that's, that's an interesting element that the, the, fundamental material may be kind of inert, but the additives and other types of ca additional chemicals may be transferable in sure. yeah. our water environment. Well, and, the, and the cotton shirt example is a really good one, right? Because fine, cotton, cotton is, you know, uh, full, full cycle, you know, will break down, et cetera. But uh, what do you typically want when you buy a white cotton shirt is for it to look really white and that's what optical brighteners do and never uh, knew yeah yeah <laughs> and the, yeah and this maybe for folks folks at home that are wondering we're wondering about this uh well one there's a thing called bluing agents and those are mostly um they're still around but m largely replaced by these optical brighteners but you know every piece of paper has this every you know white t-shirt that you buy has this um, and it's also a big part of why, um, for example, like laundry detergent, a lot of laundry detergents look kind of blue and they Ooh. fluoresce, they fluoresce this violet a little bit, um, because basically what the brightener, what the brightener is doing is making up for a little bit of yellow, um, in, in the, so, it, uh, your eye is very sensitive to yellow. And so you're very sensitive to seeing kind of off white instead of pure white. And so the way the brightener works is it actually um, fluoret. So the the you know supposedly white material, off white material, is absorbing just a little bit um, and of uh, well of blue um, to make it look yellow, right? And because it's the complementary, right? And so these basically fluoresce in that kind of violet blue to make up for it. And so then it tricks it. It's actually, um, it's actually absorbing more, but it's neutralizing the color. And so then your eye, your eye sees. So it's slightly grayer than it would have been from a pure, like how much light is being absorbed perspective. But your eye is so sensitive to yellow that you see it as a brighter white. It's pretty oh my cool. god, that's awesome. That is the sort of first and best explanation that I've heard of that. <laughs> so thank you. Sorry, sorry, yeah. it's something I, yeah, I, I thought it'd be fun to share. And obviously I love it. presentation's not about me, but I just, uh, it's it's important. Most people don't, don't know about it. And I- No, I think I, that was spectacularly helpful um, because yeah, I hadn't known about that, but then of course hear about it and think, oh, again, another thing, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's fascinating and, and makes so much sense that like, yellow just makes white look dirty. So yeah. if you can neutralize your perception of the yellow part, yep. and of course blue would do that. So cool. Uh, so yeah, so we're talking about, well, so we're also talking about a different sense right here as relation, which is taste. <laughs> and it's been this, so these microfibers have also been found in honey, salt, chicken, and I usually tell people this is like the worst this talk's gonna get. This is like the low point. It has been found in beer. Wow. So everything from no here on- No one's safe. What's that? <laughs> no, nothing is safe. No, nothing, nothing is, is sacred. <laughs> yeah. So everything from here on is about solutions and, and, and trying to make things better. So- Okay. Yeah, so that's where we're going to go to next. So that's that's all about the problem, not all of it, but uh, can, a lot of can it. Can I, while we, can, can I, so I think it's a great transition point. And I just want, you know, for me, uh, I want to dissect your process 
as much as like the problem solution is really interesting, but I also really want the audience to have a sense of what, like, what was that moment for you where you obviously, so obviously you said Rosalia project had a solutions oriented mindset, right? But now as we kind of transition and say, okay, this specific problem of microfiber, what was the sort of, I don't know, enough is enough moment, or maybe I'm mischaracterizing it, but like, how did, um, how did that evolve inside you and, and with your team? You know, it's funny for this problem, there honestly wasn't that much evolution. Okay. We heard it by like, we read a thing about it uh -huh. and our immediate reaction was just like, this is so dumb. <laughs> this is, yeah, this is crazy. And, and that this is going to be the ocean's biggest problem. That is, that okay. is virtually what we thought when, in, in that first article that we read about it, about this paper that had come out in 2011. And the article was about that, um, the article came out and there were the, like people went to outdoor gear companies and the outdoor gear companies initial response was kind of like <laughs> took the band and there there was some attention that like they were they were saying let's pay attention to this like they i think there were other people that had the same response we did which was a little bit of duh of, i've seen my clothes go thin that uh, like the stuff's not yeah. vaporizing like it did exist whole and now it, half of it is gone so it has to of mass <laughs> yeah like yeah exactly like there's it doesn't just go away uh necessarily especially something as tangible as your clothing <laughs> so um and we had been working on microplastic. It's still, it was early days of Rosalia Project. So we started in late 2009, we we're active in 2010. Our first big year of expeditions was 2011. So we were doing microplastic work, mostly floating microplastic and using nets, these plankton nets to collect it. And when you use plankton nets, the fiber that you, or the, the yeah, so the fiber that you pick up is generally the bigger stuff. So very clearly related to fishing, line and net fiber and that kind of thing. Because we're using our eyes and tweezers to get it out of the net, to wash it off of algae uh -huh. and the process. And that's pretty much how uh, most people were conducting microplastic science was with these Neustan nets. Okay. And I can show you a picture. You use a net to catch broken down nets. All right. I'm going to, yeah, right. I'm going to show you. This is what the net looked like. Oh, so cool. Just, so this is us towing a Neustan net. Neustan is where the air and the sea meet. So the water is the Neustan layer. And okay. so the net is half air, half water. So it okay. is, it is absolutely catching stuff on the surface because it's half air, half water. Got it. And, um, but the, the mesh is 333 microns. So that in the world, this world will eventually be proven to be big. Okay. 333 microns will eventually be shown to be a big mesh size. Got now, it. like you can barely see the holes with your naked eye at that yeah. size. But um, all we were really getting there were plastic fragments and these relatively large fibers that did not seem like they were from textiles. And they in fact were from fishing situations, fishing in water. Um, so, and you know, so this, can we, can we roll into actually what microfiber pollution looks like when you then switch from net, net toes to grab samples. So now, so what made the difference at Plymouth is they started doing grab samples, so jars of water. And then you take the jar of water and you use a filter down to 0.1 or 0.4 of a micron, suck all the water through. Now everything that is half a micron or more is stuck on your filter paper. Now you can see a lot more. And that's how this was essentially discovered. And uh -huh. so here's, so when we, you know, we had those three goals, we did them concurrently. 
So we started working on solution, but we're like, we need to learn more about the problem. So this was from the very first expedition we did that was specifically designed to investigate microfiber pollution. And we're sort of like, um, we're a little go big or go home. <laughs> so for our first expedition about this, we studied the entire Hudson River from Lake Terror of the Clouds to Ambrose Light, where the Hudson meets the Atlantic. We sampled the surface every three miles for the whole 300 miles of the river. Wow. Um, I have to say it was the coolest to like know an entire river or to travel the entire length of a river. That's I grew up in upstate New York. So this was also, I had visited pieces of the Hudson River my whole life. Right. As, uh, I'm a skier and one of the places I skied every single weekend and many days, weekdays as well, is just you had to drive along the Hudson to get to it, Hickory Ski Center and where my dad patrolled and um, Gore Mountain. And, and it was pretty awesome to do that. So we were taking grab samples and then filtering them. So this is very magnified image of the edge of a filter. The brown stuff in the top is what was filtered, like the organic leftovers. And these are some fibers from the wild that were pulled over. Wow. So um, in terms of diameter, you can see they're small. There's 300 micron scale for you there. You know, these are relatively long fibers because we can still actually see them. But um, this is what textile fibers look like when they've been pulled out of the river. And, and I just want to really quick share some of the science before we get to the core ball. Um, th this is the heat map from that first expedition. It wasn't the heat map I expected. I will say that based on the information that we had, we expected a pretty direct relationship between population and wastewater treatment plant uh, effluent volume. We expected a very direct relationship between those and the amount of microplastic and microfiber we found in the river. Mm -hmm. But you see, that is not what we found. So this really big red spot down kind of in no man's land, that's near Poughkeepsie down here in the um, bottom part. That right. is the single, that is the location where we found the most fibers. And that is the one that is closest to a wastewater treatment plant. So our results did not discount wastewater treatment plants. In fact, they supported, our data supported that wastewater treatment plants are a big contributor. But we did find some really interesting hotspots elsewhere and an overall uh, lack of difference in statistical concentration. So statistically speaking, there was the same concentration of microfiber across the whole river, which was fascinating. So down on the bottom, that's near the wastewater treatment plant where we found the most fibers. But those other two pictures on the top, those are the other two hotspots we found, okay. which are above where there's any, see there's waste, the first wastewater treatment plant on the Hudson is 20% of the way down the river. So above that, it's all septic systems and leach fields. Super interesting. Wow. Um, so here's some of these hotspots. Our hypothesis was that recreation was an atmospheric deposition, most likely related to back then we thought recreation. Uh, and we'll get to another um, hypothesis in a second. A colleague and friend, Professor Kirsten Kapp at Central Wyoming College, she did a similar study on the Snake River from Yellowstone to the Pacific, found nearly the same results in terms of concentration, same kind of thing as far as unexpected hotspots. Hers, these are her hotspots, and we think that um, hers are more related to agricultural runoff and the sludge from wastewater treatment plants that likely contains microfibers being put on these fields. So is there a, um, just curious, this is maybe too technical that we want to go, but I can't help but ask is like, is there a natural um, like concentration either in like really shallow regions or the kind of like slow water sections? Of the microfiber or microplastic? That's a great yeah. question. And you know, our, our results on the Hudson we didn't see a correlation to flow, okay. but we went back and we're still working on the results. Now, I haven't seen that um, in other papers, but you know, there's a lot of papers coming out now that are sort of asking and answering the like, are there fibers here? 
And it would, that would be an interesting literature review to go back and then see if people were seeing them pool. Clearly they don't swim. So they don't swim, obviously. So they are going to accumulate where anything that can't swim accumulates. So I have to think that there would be, if there were eddies that were trapping yeah. other non-swimming things like organic matter, that that's where you'd see more of this stuff as well. Um, something that we investigated is the whole water column. We just, so yeah, I'm literally right there. So this is just one last thing is when we thought, oh goodness, so this is about wastewater treatment plants, but this is about something else. And so I went outside my dryer vent and this is what I found wow. on the foliage. And then we got a new dryer and it had this screen thing on it. And this, I, I didn't even know there was a screen on it after it was installed. And I went out there at some point and found this, which is a fire hazard for sure. Yeah. And a fascinating thing. And this is dryer lint magnified. So that should look familiar. It's the same stuff. So it's happening in both our machines. Now um, we did, Kirsten, the same person who did that um, Snake River study, she and I did recently, just two months ago, publish a paper looking at dryer emissions. And that's open access. It's easy to find. It's uh, CAP and Miller, K-A-P-P. -P. Um, so yeah, so I'm not going to talk about that in this in this because there's just so much to talk about. But yeah. we did look at that. So we're going to go back now just and real quick to the question you just asked and go to our second expedition because sometimes science inspires more science. Wow, and, really? <laughs> right? <laughs> Which is awesome for someone like me. I kind of identify as an expedition scientist. And um, so it's the field side that really energizes me. And we just didn't answer enough questions looking at the surface only when we were in the Hudson the first time. So last year, thank God it was last year. And we didn't try to do it this year. We went back to the Hudson. So this was it, this very long, huge title for an expedition. We were supported in part by National Geographic, which was awesome. Cool. And we looked at the air. So two, two parts of the air up high on the mast and then my inhalation height um, to see what uh, somebody my height might be in inhaling. We had three samples on the soil looking for microplastics from where the water stopped to the bank. We did another surface, so we re replicated that. We used this really cool contraption called a Niskin bottle to also take samples at the middle of the water column and just above the river bottom. And we took little samples and put them in little vials in order to partner with um, a company is losing some advanced spectrometry equipment to see if they can detect nanoplastics. Cool. Really so that expedition was also interesting. I thought your audience would appreciate too that we supported, um, we did the sort of first field studies and some ground truthing for some really cool inventions. Uh, one of them is uh, just this, it looks like tape. It, it is tape. It looks less exciting than it is because it is absolutely amazing for anyone who's had to do any vacuum filtration and has vulnerable filters that like if you sneeze on your filter you'll ruin it like you got to go back climb the mountain get the yeah. sample again and this stuff it means that that's not the case it's genius. so what is it? it tapes to the glass slide the edges so of you you use the tape to pick everything up off the filter and oh. then it's the tape and you put it on the glass slide and now it's protected. Got it. So it's like a forensic tape kind of. That's exactly what it is. And in yeah. fact, it's invented by a team of forensic scientists who we partnered with, who moved over to bring their forensic fiber knowledge into microplastic work. So it's amazing. Very good observation. Yeah. The lead scientist, my partner, um, Dr. Claire Gwinnett at Staffordshire University um was is the mover shaker between all this and my um partner our partner for this expedition cool well something so, about that seems extremely appropriate to me because it's uh, a detective work here you know um, totally it uh, is and this is this is and, this and is the culprit the culprit is human but uh many <laughs> many same thing same as real csi this is totally csi for the ocean you're right. Like CSI are, for the ocean. I love that. We are backtracking. We're like, we found evidence 
And now we need to figure out what it is, where it came from, why it could come from there, and what we need to do to stop it. I Amazing. mean, that right there characterizes all of our work. Wow, so, a true detective. <laughs> totally. Um, and then this other cool thing, it takes a lot of the human error and contamination out of the system. Um, Ethan Edson at a company that he founded called Ocean Diagnostics. He's got there um, below his feet an in situ microplastic sampler. So it's pumping water through and it's using an optical, uh, basically a laser called FTIR. It's the Fournier infrared. Fourier transform infrared. Yes. Yes, that. Um, right there built in. Cool. And so you can download at the end of your session, you download and you see little snapshots of all the stuff that came through. So he was testing how small he could, well, how much he, what, what of the plastic, what plastic he could see and comparing it to our data using the current state of the art grab sample methods. Still working on that. Okay, so, all right, so that was our science. Okay. Now, this, I'm excited to bring you, is Corval. <laughs> I've got one here. I kind of always have one on my desk. So we, I'll just give you a little bit about the Corval, then a little bit about its evolution. Okay. So the core ball is the world's first microfiber catching laundry ball. And we thought a lot about this problem and how we were going to solve it. Um, we did think about inline washing machine filters, and that is the way this needs to go as part of the multiple solutions for this problem. Um, but we, you remember this is 2013, very few people knew about the problem. One of our other goals was to raise awareness and to also stop it right away, like to get some impact happening right away. And so we decided that per our expertise and goals, that working on an inline specific washing machine filter that didn't raise the price a ton and stuff like that, um, wasn't the way we wanted to go. We wanted to go something consumer facing mm -hmm. and we needed it to be more than 10% effective to go to market. That's how strongly we felt about the problem that even just 10% we'd go to market. Wow. Um, and so we, you know, we did think about a bag, but we wanted it to address the whole laundry and we wanted it to be as little futzing around as possible. And, um, and so we eventually, the, the evolution was to the core ball to this. And so it's made from, um, we're as circular as we can get it and still be resilient in the wash. So 100% mm -hmm. um, diverted or recycled material that is 100% recyclable, same cyclable, it doesn't drop down each time. Um, we wanted something durable, so it doesn't make microplastic. As you can imagine, that was really important, remains really important. So we needed a resilient material. And we've made a lot of decisions that are about footprint, so down to the color. So we are this color now because this is the lowest footprint color that we can have. We don't need to order this color in. There's another company in the zero waste manufacturing, our zero waste manufacturing partner, they have a lot of this stuff there. Mm -hmm. We don't need to have extra boxes shipped for other colors. Got it. So, so sorry, just so I understand, that's the, uh, given the sort of supply chain that you have, that's the lowest footprint color available to you and your partners, or there's yeah. something, because I, I guess one of the things that I remember learning from um, uh, Michael Brongart, uh, Cradle to Cradle, is like, there's no green green. And so yeah. I'm wondering, did was did you replace the green in the one on the screen to the one in the hand for that reason or just because this was where you could get lots of uh, recycled uh, material in this color this was footprint yeah okay. so this was just footprint um footprint decisions got it mostly related to things like shipping and the existence of in a lot of it's shipping footprint related and not having little boxes of color for our relatively small orders compared to these huge, huge orders. Got it, got it. Uh, let's see, it is made entirely in the US. So also thinking of sort of transportation footprint, we are not doing any of this in Asia. We're not 
fulfilling it somewhere else. Uh, we're keeping things very close. We'll get to that a little bit later. And we also have sort of minimal packaging. So in terms of how you use it, you just throw it in your washing machine. Super easy, drop it, throw it, whatever. And, um, and then on the design, it is inspired by coral. So my best way to describe this is that we had started with this little thing that looked like a soap dish and had lots of filter things in it. Um, and it really just, we wanted it to attach to the inside of the drum. But all that happened was the clothes kept bashing it off the side. It just didn't work. <laughs> it really didn't work. Uh, so we kind of had to stop and we had to think, what are we trying to do? And not stop microfiber pollution, but like really mechanically, what are we trying to do? And we said, we are trying to catch small things from moving water. Like that was the simplest way to describe our goal. And when we thought of it that way, we realized that coral totally That's does that. that. Yeah, coral is like stuck to a rock and it catches small things from moving water. That's amazing. So that is- Biomimicry. Biomimicry, exactly. Nature does it best. And so why try to do better than nature? So these are little coral-like stalks that, um, that help mechanically wrap, the fiber gets literally stuck in here. Wow. And then fiber attracts more fiber, more fiber gets stuck to more fiber. I have to say one exciting moment was at a conference when I met um, Dr. Sylvia Earle. And uh, she, I, we were chatting and I showed her a coral ball and her first response was that it looked like a sea creature. So that was, a, that was an awesome like moment. A yeah, I, I was like- For a so biomimetic like, designer. Yeah. In the in the wash, it cruises around, of course, with your clothes, not against them. Okay. Uh, there were weird, unfounded rumors spread initially that we somehow caused more shedding. Interestingly, I will share that scientifically, it's been shown that the exact opposite happens, that we help reduce shedding. Um, and yeah, we're not sure exactly how. We, oh. I think it might help reduce well, it's not abrading you have this this soft um sorry to interrupt but like you have the 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 tip is uh circular and smooth right and right. so you're not on purpose you're not, you're not abrading the 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 clothes and there's not but, even yeah. there there aren't even um artifacts from the injection molding on the outside like the outside is smooth on purpose. This was designed to be to be gentle on your clothes, to not right. cause more. Um, and you saw it just goes with them. I think this helps reduce the friction between clothing because it kind of helps pin the maybe, this is one hypothesis, oh. pin the clothes to the drum. So would, <laughs> if one Cora ball is 10% effective, are 10, 100% effective or are you? So it's better that, so 10% was our minimum. Oh, okay. So Sorry. we were getting up to 30% in our in-house testing. Wow. And there's been two independent tests. One got 26% and the other 31%. So, so if um, I buy three, does that go to a hundred percent? No. And <laughs> the reason I think it doesn't is because we can't guarantee that the Cora balls all address different parts of the water column because if the Cora balls lined up behind each other. Yeah, yeah. Then they're these basically. Guys, yeah, these two wouldn't get any. Uh, they're, as seeing much. The, they're seeing the same uh, volume fractions. So, yeah, exactly, exactly. So that's that's my thoughts on why it does it does increase, but it doesn't increase in a direct relationship. We can't just yeah put three in and get ninety three percent. Okay. Or four, or put three in and get that would yeah that would be ninety three percent. So. So here's what it looks like. So you use your Cora ball and eventually you get these tangles of fuzz. The, you clean it like you clean a hairbrush. So you just pinch the fuzz ball out. Notice the fuzz ball kind of looks mostly like hair and just it's hard to tell what you're looking at. Mm -hmm. So we get out our awesome digital microscope uh -huh. and we realize that what you see with your naked eye and it's just, you don't even know what it is, is a lot of fiber. Look how tiny it is. That big brown thing was a piece of hair, so it's so much smaller. And this 
is what we were looking at. Stubby pencil pointing at that tiny little fuzzball with so many pieces of microfiber in it. So, um, so we've gotten some great attention across the board. We had a successful Kickstarter campaign, which for which we are grateful. And um, so we've had some media and we've had these independent peer review publish, published tests. So um, again, these are the two papers that have done the efficiency testing, 26% and 31%. The latest uh, lead author is Imogen Knapper. That was also out of University of Plymouth. Um, they also found that it reduces shedding. So that's what we thought, but it's nice to be proven. And something that we appreciated out of the McGillwraith paper from University of Toronto was they really looked at the foundation of kind of our solution here, which is the concept that lots of littles make a big, is the way I like to say it. Yeah. Is Lots of little problems in the ocean are adding up to a big problem in the ocean, but lots of efforts, little efforts by individual households can add up to big impact. And they straight up put that to numbers and said that if the community, everyone in Toronto used the Cora ball, the collectively, the community would be keeping literally trillions of fibers out of their wastewater treatment plant, yeah. which is nice. Like that is oh, amazing. what collective action looks like. Yeah, it's like it reminds. It's like the microfiber. I might be remembering the day of the week wrong, but it's uh, it's like the microfiber analog of like the meatless Monday. Totally, totally. <laughs> yes, yeah. meatless Monday adds up. I know. <laughs> yeah. We, uh, and one and one thing I want to say that I just love is the it's not so. I think there's, I I, I like. I'm super into thinking about scaling, right? And like fractals and dimensionality of problems. And where do you, where do you solve the problem most effectively? And from one, from one angle, what I love about this is there's like the kill it in the egg aspect, right? Which is like kill the fibers in the washing machine as they're coming off of the clothes to not go pick up uh, nine trillion <laughs> just from <laughs> Toronto later, right? Um, but then at the same time, what I also love is you'd, you'd probably still be working your butt off to get to the 10% if you had gone straight to the washer and dryer machine makers, right? Because they, so there was a, there was a sort of an appropriate uh, place at which you say, okay, the, there's, um, so on the front end, there's leverage. There, there's leverage and killing it in the egg in your dryer. But then, like backwards from that, it's there is a collective responsibility. There's a, um, you know, it's actually we could be more effective with adding up lots of little things and working directly with people who care about it and educating people who care about it. And I'm sure all of the washer and dryer. People are now, you know, on their whatever five-year development cycle, thinking, right. "Oh man, I could I could charge double for a washer dryer that doesn't do this, at least in Berkeley." Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean they're working on it. Sure. But they're but I love that you went, you found that place where you, it's like, okay, um, you know, we can't sort of decree this on a global scale, right? But we can have an impact on a global scale from a small step from just throw it in. Yeah, literally like throwing it in. And you know, another thing we were thinking at this is there's conversations that we can inspire and we'll never know if we did this, but there's the, why'd you throw the cat toy in the washing machine? <laughs> you know, there's that conversation, the one where there's an active participation, although it's very easy, it's not like invasive into your life to use this thing. Uh -huh. But there is that reminder that our drains are connected to the natural world. And like our homes are connected to the natural world. Right. And for us, if we, that there's, that there's value in that reminder. Like I personally hope that there's less acetone and pills being flushed down the toilet because of the core ball. And I don't know if that's a stretch or not, right. but I think there's, I, I have a shred of hope that there's some level of 
uh, connection that can be made yeah, between and, and making it yeah. and making it visible, right? It's sort of right. out of sight, out of mind. And for most people in, you know, uh, the countries that are going to have the most YouTube viewers, <laughs> at mm -hmm. least, right? They, there is no, you don't see your, um, you know, your waste. You don't see that impact. No. So I love and that. You, this is something you can't even see. Right. You and you made it visible. Well. Yeah. Yeah. So I did include, just because this is sort of about invention, a little bit of evolution. Ooh, whoa, look at that one. This was the first one. 3D so printed? This was, yeah, 3D printed. Cool. It had two parts. So it was an outer cage. So you can see the outer cage. And then look inside and you see what would eventually become the coral ball. So the inner part was the coral. Wow. This was all hard. And yeah. the, the model initially was a subscription program where you, the, the fiber caught on the inner stuff and you, we would kind of, it would take some time, but we'd eventually figure out how long it took everybody's inner to get full of fiber. And then you'd, you'd get a box with a new one. You'd throw your used one in the box and send it back to us. And through this subscription program, we would sort of guarantee the circularity mm -hmm. and getting it all back. Cause that's a very big challenge is the- Sure. Get it actually back. what's, that's a question I have. And actually this was some, this is probably the most, sorry, not to take this too far away from here, but I'll just give okay. you an example where this was really depressing. Mm -hmm. um, when I was in Bali, I learned from, uh, from someone there that basically uh, they have a huge, plastic pollution problem and yeah. um and it, a lot of it's education a lot of it's that the indian sea is or sorry the indonesian sea is very shallow um and so you see it more um but one of the things that was very depressing is they said well actually even when you are throwing things in the municipal trash the a lot of it i don't know what percentage of it but a lot of it basically the people who are supposedly uh responsibly disposing that trash take it on a giant boat bring the boat out just far away enough that no one sees them dump it back in the ocean and so i'm curious with the, the core ball example what is the most responsible way to dispose of the the microfiber lint um, that you collect from your core ball um, can i just quick ask what year were you in bali when you this was like two years ago um, so yeah, twenty. Yeah. I think yeah, it was about exactly. Uh, so I guess it would have been just the beginning of twenty uh, nineteen, or mm -hmm. like I, the last few days of twenty eighteen. I think. Yeah, copy. Um, so that's it. so. What do you do with your dryer lint right now? Dryer lint. Where do you put it? Uh, I guess it. <laughs> well, I, collected it in a, I collected it in a pile on top of the dryer, and then when it gets big, I put it in the trash. <laughs> right. So it's the same stuff, and right now it has to go to the same place. Okay. So it's a fascinating, for me, this particular issue, I find fascinating because oh. landfills in, so let's go with the U.S. Yeah. and uh, you just sort of countries where washing machine use is ubiquitous or nearly so. Um, I do get a fair amount of like, kind of, you could consider it pushback over throwing the fibers that you get out of the core ball into the wash even though i've never heard anyone push back throwing dryer or, no, sorry throwing it in the trash in the trash Got throwing it. the the, the uh, lint that you get from the core ball into the trash i've never heard anyone complain about throwing dryer lint in the trash got it so first of all it's the same stuff second of all most people's problem is they're like I'm going to throw it in the trash and it's just going to end up in the ocean anyway because microplastics are leaking out of uh, leaking out of landfills. But I would like to see some evidence of that. And I really would. Like if people listening have the papers that show that microfibers are leaching out of landfills in the US, in Canada, in the UK, in places like that with well-developed landfill, highly technological landfills. And I'm not a fan of landfills. I would like them not to have to exist, which I'll get sure. to that in a second. But I don't, they seem to have, 
this reputation as being far worse than they actually are. And it's fascinating. I don't know how that kind of developed. I, I, I missed how that happened. So, um, so the, the answer to it is right now, you do have to throw it away. It yeah. is not immediately bioavailable, nor is it guaranteed that it ever will be bioavailable if you put it in the washing machine, or if, if you put it in the trash. Uh, because a lot of places are doing uh, waste to energy, incineration, that yeah. guarantees that it's not bioavailable. If you don't do anything, it goes through your septic system leach field or it goes into a wastewater treatment plant yeah. where right now, all the evidence points to it becoming bioavailable. Right. That either it goes through the wastewater treatment plant, even the ones that they're, they're stopping 90 plus percent we don't know where the 90% that gets stopped is going. There are a lot of those places take the solids and they dry them and they end up as agricultural fertilizer, which is spectacular adaptive reuse of a resource. Right. But it does mean if those microfibers haven't been somehow vaporized in the kiln drying process, and we don't know if they are or aren't, yeah. they end up on the fields and then they're runoff and they still end up in the water. Okay. Wow. So there's a really interesting kind of, I have a lot, I have a list of topics that need researching. That's so amazing. send me your capstone project students and okay. I got a list. All right. Calling all capstone project students. Rachel is taking writers. Yes. People Rachel has a mission for you. That's I've amazing. I've got a list. You can pick biology, more chemistry, yeah. physics. Like it got a. So well, I was, I was, I was kind of thinking, you know, it, I, if I had a microscope and some tweezers, you know, maybe on each fiber, there'll be that little number. Uh, number yeah, right, a little RFID I tag. I put it in the right recycling bin. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. No, you know, the, there is a signature though. There's a, there's a signature and we, thanks to Claire Gwinnett and her team, we are identifying each and every fiber that we found in the 2019 Hudson River expedition to we're not able to get to additives with the technique we're using, but we're able to get to the type of plastic. So, and yeah, so I can't wait. Maybe you'll have me back. I can share the results in a year. Okay. Yeah, COVID let's do it. in between us and our lab. So things are going slower as they have been for everybody. Yeah. So at some I'll point we will have papers and data and results that hopefully point to something really useful from a solution standpoint. That's so um, I'll just real quick why we didn't go forward with this. Yeah, we did do some market research and we got some very appropriate pushback in the form of I've never heard of microfiber pollution, but I understand how I'm part of it. I will buy your thing, but I will only buy it once. I will not do a subscription program for this. Yeah, it was the darkest greens that were like, sure, whatever, I'll do it. But everybody else was like, I don't want to keep paying for that. And yeah. we said, okay, that's fair. What their feedback was, they wanted to be, as I call it, the masters of their own microfiber destiny. They wanted to do it themselves. And so we also learned how expensive the cage was gonna be and how impossible it was to make the thing that we designed uh, in the middle, because it was 3D printable, yeah. not injection moldable. Yeah, uh, no one had come up with amazing photopolymers that could Ask the properties of injection molded uh, plastics yet, you know, at that time. No, not that. Just to, not just to put it, just put it out there. I don't know anybody working on that problem, but. Yeah, no, you're right. That is. There wasn't enough materials for 3D printing to make the core ball real. No, you're right. It's fascinating. And in fact, the materials. So here's 3D printed core balls, early ones, uh, test, test ones. And um, thank God for 3D printing. I. I have such a hard time even conceiving of how we could have done this without 3D printing. I, mm -hmm. I don't know that we could have. We didn't have the resources to do whatever it is people used to do, have to make a mold for every single idea that they had. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, what a nightmare process. Yeah. It is incredible what 3D yeah. printing has done for like the iterative process of developing a thing to solve a problem. I, yeah, yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely incredible. 
That's amazing. So, Can I ask a question? Because yeah. I'm really curious. Did, did uh, so, you know, obviously here you were using 3D printing in the context of prototyping, and mm -hmm. then you were, you're now using injection molding for production. And one of the, actually the very first guests, um, Spencer Wright and I were t joking, like, uh, why do people do Kickstarters? It's, it's the pay for the molds <laughs> to be able to, to do the injection molding, right? Because as big as there's this huge yeah. upfront cost, it, was that true? It, it, was that a, a big cost for you? Was that where a big part of the Kickstarter funds went was to pay for the, the molding to get set up? That was our original intent. In the end, we did have a grant oh, that cool. helped us with the molds. And what the Kickstarter was for, for us, was to get it all going, to buy the material and Okay. make that first order so we were very lucky um Great. our original expectation in the very beginning was that we were gonna have to kickstarter for the like kickstart for the molds crowdfund Great. for the molds so um, roughly what again we don't need to go into your finances i'm just curious was that a quarter million dollars for the mold was it less was oh it no far less than that it was oh. under it was under sixty thousand for our molds that's pretty good yeah yeah, I mean, it's cool. very straightforward, but- um, Not something you wanna pay on, put on your credit card. <laughs> no, 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 definitely not. And you know, it, the thing about 3D printing is, it, well, here's this, this is, this is now getting into- Whoa, so cool. Detail. Yeah. Let's do this. So this is about, uh, this is in between, this is after the Kickstarter. So the Kickstarter exceeded our expectations every day multiple times a day i was wrong about something every day of the kickstarter <laughs> that's amazing like, you're learning oh, totally like we'll get to whatever number in two weeks and we would get to it in two hours I'm like okay well so anyway so with the kickstarter we ended up with 15 and a half thousand core balls pre-ordered holy our, cow our original expectation was we'd make a thousand like that was kind of where we were, maybe 2000. And, um, and so we had a very big order, initial order, like the material, we weren't gonna have this kind of slow rollout like we kind of thought was gonna happen where we would make them for a bunch of people, they'd be used and we'd have time to tweak and da -da. No, we had to kind of come out with some good decisions made and the biggest decision was the material because clearly our criteria had to be that it wasn't virgin, that it was both recycled or some level of diverted and like it was something that we were keeping out of a landfill and it wasn't gonna, it didn't need to end up in a landfill again. You know, there, there's some level of lack of control that the manufacturer has at the back end, but at least by making it possible, you kind of do it as much as you can do along with education. Yeah. And so, um, so yeah, so here's some of our material <laughs> journey, nightmare. It was a nightmare. Uh, you can see, like, look at the crazy warpage and shrinkage and breakage or something you can't see. I just have to take my word for it. It was too hard to like rip yep. up the clothes or rip up your fingers trying to get in yeah, yeah. to get the fibers. And the 3D print wasn't gonna work because it literally took three days to print on the sort of <laughs> Ultimaker two, yeah, yeah. three days. Right. to do one core ball. And that's if and the for those that don't know, it probably takes three minutes <laughs> to injection mold. <laughs> so not even. Yeah. Yeah. Three minutes when you get all the parts. Right. But three like, minutes combined. For <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, we're, this is really untenable. And you know, and again, one of the reasons we had a fleeting thought of of open access, you know, of open um of giving it out to people. Okay. More importantly, besides the fact it would take forever, is the material, 3D printed material, certainly at the time, and that most people have access to, made microplastic. Like it, yeah. it was not resilient. It didn't stick together. It, it, it's harsh in a washing machine. And it also needs to be safe in the dryer for when you accidentally have it bundled in the clothes and it ends up in the dryer. Okay. 
Um, so a little bit more about some of our footprint. So here's a map of Vermont. So Corabal headquarters are there in the mountains. Um, we started out with four people. Rosalia, we have a great executive director. She is based in uh, Burlington. So our zero waste manufacturing is an hour away over another set of mountains. We do use a separate uh, assembly and fulfillment center. So that's also an hour away up the valley. That's why it's the difference in distance and it's still an hour. Everything's an hour in Vermont. Um, so what's great assembly and shipping, that's one place. There are a lot of people, it is very tempting to send it from manufacturing to assembly and then ship it again to a shipper, to a fulfillment center who then ships it out to the people. Um, so we're lucky that we don't need to do that again. And here's the best part. Concept two, have you heard of them? They make the rowing ergs and um, other exercise machines. I haven't, but it sounds cool. They're awesome. They use the same two companies. They are bigger than us. They have their own truck that goes around and around. And oh, so they've so given us- ride. Yeah, we've Another hitched a ride. Another biomimetic principle, small Tur organism hitching a ride on a large one. Yes. So <laughs> we're, uh, they've given us a pallet space and we get to put our stuff on the truck that goes north. And then the truck that is empty going south isn't empty anymore. It's got all of our packaging from manufacturing coming back. Wow. So we are pretty much zero packaging waste or zero waste packaging waste between manufacturing and assembly. They That's just put amazing. the boxes and stuff back on. And we're really proud of that. It's like, Again, a little thing, but it adds up over the years, the trips and that kind of thing. Um, and then I do just wanna, before I kind of finish with some philosophy, just wanted to share, you know, remember I said that one of our goals was awareness. Um, so, and, and spreading the word. And one of the ways we did that, and this is through Rosalia Project and our expertise with education and uh, experiential education and solutions oriented scientific STEM education is to um, create activities and deliver uh, these really fun like summer science it's it's now science for all the time but we operate in the summer this is with at a yacht club in long island sound where we're looking at uh, what this particular activity is what causes shedding so we have these mason jars see it's also it's not just boys we call this bikini science. This is summer fun science during sailing class. Um, you can see some mason jars. Those are the washing machines. And we work with people of all ages, but obviously in this case, these are um, uh, middle schoolers who are um, asking questions about, well, is it agitation speed? Is it how much water you use? How much you stuff a washing machine, temperature of the water? All those kind of factors is we're replicating that and testing. And um, our little experiment actually does work. It replicates uh, published, published results as far as some of these variables. Yeah. And um, it's very fulfilling. And if anyone is listening and would like this uh, activity, we just started working, well, we just completed working with uh, NOAA's Marine Debris Program and other great partners who work on this problem, Blue Ocean Society and one of our partners called the Booth Basie and Science Center. And we produced a teacher kit, uh, a teacher guide to deliver. And this would be good for parents too, especially in the age of homeschool and stuff like that, um, to deliver this particular microfiber activity. Uh, cool. so, yeah, just email, uh, you can email, the easiest thing I think would be just info at coraball.com and I've got that at the end. Okay. So, um, or yeah, yeah, we'll just go with that. Okay, so the other thing that I share and that I wanna kind of wrap up with is just a little bit of sort of our philosophy on solutions and our sort of guiding things. So one is that all of these problems that we work on, whether we're working on marine debris as a sort of big picture derelict fishing gear or microfiber pollution from our textiles is I am a firm believer in the, um, just let's all not expect that there's one easy way to fix basically anything. And the more we have a collective uh, reconciliation with this 
because it's less satisfying than just the sort of silver bullet. But uh, the sooner we can all recognize this, I think the sooner we make big impact so that it's going to take solutions with an S. The Corabol is not the solution to microfiber pollution. It is not. Mm -hmm. But it is one of the solutions. You've already, oh, oh so <laughs> uh, sometimes I say that and then somebody says, well, if you could do one thing, what would it be? Like, Buy a Corabol. <laughs> no, God, there's no one thing. Yeah, right? Buy a Corabol. But what I would do is if I had to pick one thing, it's like do this kind of universal mind meld of all the people everywhere. And the message that I would deliver and to imprint into people's brains is, is that there should be no waste. And the positive way to state that for me is that everything has value. So it has value for the reason you bought it or made it or whatever, but then it's done that but it still has value as an object. And it may be positive value, it may be negative value. Maybe its value is as something that's harmful. And, but either way, if we think about that, I think we wouldn't have waste. We would have constant circular design and um, a lot more respect for our natural world and its resources. Um, this is something that I kind of, evolved with Rosalia Project and we work with MIT's Environmental Solutions Initiative and they have the name for it. And so this is the concept that I love of radical interdisciplinarity to solve problems. So this for me means diverse diversity. It's on, uh, for Rosalia Project, we take volunteers on the boat. And I used to have mostly pretty much undergrads in science with a bend towards marine science. And that was great. It was great. I, I loved these kids and we did our thing. But then one year I switched it up and we ended up with a team on the boat of multiple ages, real multiple um, academic and professional backgrounds. And honestly, we haven't looked back and we've tried to keep adding just to realize that having someone in every age from age decade from 20s to 60s, that's amazing. Then to have people from sciences, education, policy, we had someone on board who, she's an accountant by trade, but she was the mom of two fishermen. And she was such an important asset to our conversations in the Gulf of Maine, where nearly everything we find is trash from the lobstering industry, which she was an environmentalist whose two sons are lobster fishermen. It was amazing. Her perspective was as important as any of the scientific perspectives that we had as we were looking at this problem. Wow, so so um, we have people from different geographies. So people from the West Coast and people from the middle and people from other countries to come on board and share their experiences. And you know, this is beyond the sort of obvious of gender, ethnic, and other types of diversity that in sort of our overall society need more attention and, and that kind of thing. But this sort of goes beyond even that. This is saying, we're not just bringing scientists on board, we're bringing scientists of a whole lot of scientific disciplines. Like we're going beyond just the basics. Mm -hmm. um, I already said this one, lots of littles make it big. So my last is um, something that's, I think controversial to some of our colleagues in the marine debris world, but something that we believe in. And um, that is there's power in large corporations to do some good, not just to do bad. And mm -hmm. the reality is, is that when a large corporation demands something better, especially as it relates to um, like a material or something like that, they create the scale that enables this better whatever to be accessible to other people. And so that's what we mean by cut a wide path. Yeah. Um, so are there any examples there that you want to share in terms of either like the Patagonia one was really cool. I love that they're, you know, don't buy this sweater, <laughs> you know, they, they've kind of uh, clearly have that as part of the brand. Um, and, and 
I, the, as soon as you put that at the bottom, I, my mind immediately jumps to thinking of people like Amory Lovins, who just like, he'll just go, you know, call Walmart every day for a year and be like, hey, did you know that you could improve the fuel efficiency of your trucking fleet for the exact same price of the one that you already have? And, but uh, anyways, not to get distracted, are there, yeah. are there corporate initiatives that, that you want to highlight as being like a, a big win or could you, you think could have a really big impact? Well, I can tell you where I like the lightning bolt to make me realize like we had already kind of signed on to that mm -hmm. uh, because we were working with uh, the Trash Free Seas Alliance and the American Chemistry Council. And so we had already fundamentally believed that, that, um, but I hadn't had a way to really describe it until I was at the uh, global summit or the global climate action summit in San Francisco a couple of years right. ago. And I was in an audience like pretty close to the front because how could I not when Alec Baldwin was interviewing Jane Goodall. Okay. And Paul, oh my God, I just forgot his last name, the CEO of Unilever. I don't know that off the top of my head. Yeah, so the CEO of Unilever on one side of Alec Baldwin and Jane Goodall on the other side. And- And no gorillas in sight or- <laughs> Yeah, no gorillas in sight. Okay. In this pretty striking background, actually. So, um, oh, and Jane Goodall had a little stuff, stuffed guys with her. Awesome. So, so there's this amazing conversation that happened obviously about her work. And then Alec Baldwin turned to um, a guy in charge of a big company. Yeah. <laughs> a really big company. And what he talked about was he said, look, we are committed to finding sustainable palm oil. Now, palm oil is something I personally have been interested in, but we haven't gone like public. And my little pushback, personal pushback is my husband and I don't buy anything with palm oil in it. And on the boat, we don't buy anything with palm oil in it, which means it's really hard to get cookies. And yeah. so on the boat, we always make our own cookies and, and we ask people to come with their favorite cookies. Okay. And it, it's like, it's kind of a nice thing. It's, it's sweet, both literally and figuratively. And, and it means that we don't support unsustainable palm oil for a million reasons. So, so this guy says, we're committed to finding sustainable palm oil. And he's got so many brands of packaged goods that would use that. And it was interesting because he said this sentence that really stuck with me. He said, and we're bringing Walmart with us. Okay. And that was this kind of lightning bolt for me of this incredible power. So I don't even know at that point, I didn't know that you could get sustainable palm oil. I hadn't read about it. Like I, I hadn't seen, it was like either you used palm oil and it was terrible or you found a different oil. <laughs> And I just, I don't know, that 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 was a very um that was like a little bit of a moment for me to be like, yeah, that that puts into a description why we believe that working with these big companies is important. Yeah. That there is a place for the picketers and the people yelling and stuff like that, but there is also a place for scientifically solutions oriented driven nonprofits to sit at the table. Yeah. with these big companies and see if we can get them to paint the wide like to carve the wide paths too it's okay. tough it's, you know it, i don't know if that's been achieved yet i need to check up on that okay yeah wow well thank you <laughs> so what i have here is a thought on uh just big picture design thinking circular I and mean, you've already quoted cradle to cradle Circular economy is a phrase you used all over, but also by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. And to specifically apply it to the problem that we've been working on, um, these, this language is the big picture description, but to apply it to microfiber, and you already kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, is so there's a couple strategies to keep from polluting here in this case. And one would be to prevent the leakage. So prevent the leakage in our case, would be that the textile industry makes our clothing more resilient mm -hmm. so that our clothes break less. 
when where is everything under the microscope should look like the uh the wetsuit (laughs) it certainly does break less while still providing all of the awesome breathability all that other stuff but yeah basically we it can be fuzzy but as long as it's not breakable fuzz yeah so that's the first thing is to say while we wear it while we wash it while we while we dry it in all of its experiences our textiles do need to be more resilient now that we know that when they fall apart they're pinging their little bits into the world our natural world stopping the leakage clearly is where we live with the core law so that's acknowledging that we're not going to have just one solution which means we can't just stop it all that means that some clothes will still break in this case in the wash and when that happens we want to catch it before it goes out the drain and that's kind of obviously the con- sort of consumer solution or the in washing machine solution in line, that kind of thing. Um, for me, that would also be like if wastewater treatment plants had some way to stop it. I personally don't put a lot of pressure on them. We've had a couple tours. Oh God, I think they have bigger problems to solve like getting the hormones out and stuff like that. Yeah. So, I'm pretty happy to lay off of them more than, you know, like it would be great to figure out the mass balance with the way, with the wastewater treatment and to say, okay, the ones that are stopping 95%, we know they're stopping 95%. There's been influent and effluent studies, but what hasn't been answered is this, well, okay, where does the, where does it go? So that we need to know. But so then the last piece is closing the loop. This one as it applies to microfiber is a little bit odd because it sort of implies that we take what we catch in our washer dryer, so the laundry lint collectively, and we put it back into the system. So that would mean recycling our laundry lint. Yeah. I understand it sounds absurd to say that, but you never know that that may not work. It may be as simple as just another bin and recycling Uh, place. And the reality is, is that right now that can't happen because if we just took the clothes you and I are wearing and we wrote down all the fibers that we've got on right now, there could be 10 different just between the two of us. And that level of, um, that's like different tensile strengths, different melt temperatures, a zillion different factors that make one really bad material (laughs) yeah well and they won't and they won't uh even want to mix right um and you might not even be able to make something right yeah so So, actually can i can i sorry i sorry apologies for interrupting but i just had an idea and and i list i think my brain is wired this way when you but just you said you know we can't we can't do something and i'm like i we got it i think we could i got it like what's i hope so So here's here's my idea it's, okay. It's, it's maybe not scalable, but I think it'd be really fun. We're going to have a Corabal lint art competition. Sweet. Sweet. People are going to take all their lint and turn it into art. And this, I'm actually, this, you know where I got this idea is there's a, I forget which company it is. There's a ski uh, and snowboard company that you have all these scraps from the carbon fiber of making them. Yeah. And like, what do we do with this? Um, and they they make art out of it. They make the, they made like a giant Yeti sculpture <laughs> of all the scraps. Uh, so obviously there, I'm like lots of chemists working on ways of recycling carbon fiber. Uh, there's a bunch of people doing really totally. cool things there, but until we have that, I think it will have to become art. You want to hear something cool, though? So I uh, have been mentoring students at the New York Harbor School. New York Harbor okay. School, uh, Governor's Island. They um, are a school for the marine trades or high school. And it's like earth shatteringly cool. And I've been working with the marine biology students. And a couple of years ago, uh, one, the, the, um, the guy I was mentoring his idea, he actually came in second in the like New York City Science Fair with this, is he took laundry lint and he made hats. That's awesome. Basically, yeah, he he looked at me using like natural glues to, it was sort of a felting glue project. And um, 
yeah, so there's there's that. They're sort of taking it and sort of felting it and compressing it and turning it into um, fashion. Cool, fashion. So it's still an art project. You know, it's in the art world, in the fashion yeah, category. Yeah, right, exactly. Art, art yeah. with the, the broadest definition. Exactly. And uh, so, you know, I do, There, I have a, a colleague, part of the Schmidt Marine Technology Partners Group, who he said, if we can prove that 80% of the fuzz we come up with is polyester, he can turn it back into polyester. He can, he can extrude it again. He can, he can turn it back into filament fiber. That's great. Which is amazing. So, so here's the, the, the challenge then is to have some kind of sensor that takes the fuzz and, and says this is 70% or whatever percent, 80% um, of whatever material, or can somehow some process that could separate it. That's, that's the problem right now. You know what would be the best thing ever is a plastic magnet that you could dial to certain plastics. So you like dial up the polypropylene and, and it sucks up all the polypropylene. Mm -hmm. And then you put that somewhere and then you dial it to polyester. That would be amazing. Yeah, my friend Mike Biddle spent the first oh. half of his career solving this for uh, you know traditional thermoplastics for recycling, but I think it's a very different problem on the micro and nano scale. So I met Mike at a plasticity event. That's awesome. He's yeah. a real, real inspiration to me, and awesome. uh, yeah, cool. he's a cool guy. I have some final, final, final words things. of wisdom. Yeah, some, some. Did, we broke this up into people who are just working in their own homes and people who are working in their businesses to take some action. We call this 2.0 because 1.0 is the reusable bags, the coffee mugs stuff like that. So we know that. I feel like I would be insulting your audience to tell them to bring coffee mugs like reason okay. coffee. So we have some suggestions to, so for your own home to just, you know, rethink the stuff that only lasts once. I believe that we can find joy in colorful things produced by nature rather than not nature, um, as it relates to balloons, I'm not a big fan. Uh, and that there's, you know, this kind of movement to repair, spot clean, do stuff like that. Um, it makes a difference, it really does. Uh, and we do encourage people to do cleanups, but when you do a cleanup to include the data component, because not everyone needs necessarily a straw ban they may need something else immediately because your local place has 10 times as much plastic bag trash as straw trash, or it might be the reverse. And knowing that is giving you the power to actually make some, something change or to realize that you need to come up with something new in the first place. You know, yeah. it's, uh, it's that information. It was science that caused us to start this uh, Coraball project. And then on the, on the design side for people working on um, well, whatever it is that think about the big picture, that everything has value at all times. And is your thing going to have negative value and what are all the actions you can take to reduce that from happening? And that you can find opportunities to lower your footprint and I just didn't even realize this until I was forced to, into manufacturing <laughs> uh, to, to do it. It, it just, uh, there's so many places and I will say none of it is easy. The system is set up to make very bad decisions for the environment. It is easier to make high environmental impact decisions than it is to make low ones. Yeah. But the more we all ask that, there's opportunities to be lower footprint, the more likely there will be those solutions. So um, that's what I encourage, this kind of looking at all the parts and then to be ready to monitor and adjust. I think one of the things I've found, there's a lot of things I've found disturbing about the last nine months, <laughs> but one of the most disturbing things I have found about the last nine months is, um, over the whole mask wearing thing that like at one point, Dr. Fauci 
said, we don't think masks work. And that that statement was held against him even after we absolutely unequivocally scientifically know that masks work. Mm -hmm. And so there's just something about that that just frustrates me beyond all everything. So I well, do and, Yeah, and science is making mistakes and learning from them right. and being honest and, and correcting them. Right, and, and the reality is, is that there will be some of the stuff that I'm telling people will be proven wrong because right. we got into this before there was very much science and, and already we've had to backtrack. It turns out using your delicate thing on your wash, the delicate setting, that does not reduce the amount of fibers produced. Okay. Because it uses a lot of water and oh, a yeah. lot of water causes the clothes we think to friction and it just, that doesn't, now less um, aggressive spinning, that does. Okay. That okay. does reduce. But we used to say, I had it printed on cards. Part of our packaging said something that we have now updated. We've updated our cards as we've learned. And so, as people try to make an impact, I do want to emphasize the need to be willing to monitor and adjust and to realize that there may be some things that were great attempts, but eventually get proven not to be as awesome as something else. And uh, yeah, and so the final final is something, um, there's a Netflix series called Abstract, which I find absolutely fascinating. I don't know if you watched it. I don't I think so. No. I recommend it. Okay. Each episode is a designer in a different artistic discipline, but again, with a very broad, no, there's no fine art there. It's all design related, oh, okay. uh, design okay. disciplines. And one of them was about shoe design and um, Tinker Hatfield said this, and this for a lot really um, represents my experience, both with Rosalia Project and the Cora Ball. And it's this sort of concept that if people aren't reacting at all, then you're not really making much of an impact. Yeah. But if you want to make an impact, you do need to brace yourself for some hate mail. Because if you want love letters, you need to be prepared for hate mail yeah. because you can't have one without the other. That if you're moving people, you're moving them both ways and to just be prepared for that and then to embrace it. That's amazing. We, uh, yeah, we get, we do get more love letters than hate mail. Uh, and that's obviously the ratio you want to strive for. But we did have someone write us a hate poem uh, during the Kickstarter campaign. Oh, a hate poem. A hate poem, hate like poem. an entire multiverse hate poem on Facebook. And <laughs> It was one of the sort of first things like that, that had happened. And at first I was like, well, that sucks. <laughs> like, ugh. you know, it does, it's not nice to have any ire <laughs> directed in your direction, but I've actually come to sort of appreciate the hate poem in particular mm -hmm. because this, it was vitriolic. The guy was really unimpressed with what we had done, <laughs> and, but he spent, what, 20 minutes, 30 minutes thinking about microfiber pollution uh -huh. and our solution to it and how much he hates it. But like we moved him to take a significant part of his day thinking about microfiber pollution. That's so beautiful. And Do you remember I, any lines from the hate poem? <laughs> um, well, it's interesting from our little pre-conversation, it, it did say something about how stupid it was to use plastic to protect the ocean from plastic. <laughs> Which I'm on the opposite end of the spectrum as a polymer chemist, I find the most beautifully ironic part of the entire project, so. Yeah, no, and we get it. It's a little, it can be hard to swallow. Uh, I should find the hate poem again. I, I think I screenshotted it and then it got buried. It was it was within the first few hours of the face of the uh, Kickstarter coming out. Okay. And um, yeah, I should find it. Well, that's but so I do believe that, and this advice that I've given to people who are also kind of striking out to do something new or to work on a problem that has some controversy attached to it or not, um, mm -hmm. is just to, 
to know that you're gonna get pushback and that fundamentally it's a good thing because it means you are inspiring a reaction. Yeah, I love that. What's the, uh, the opposite of love isn't hate, it's indifference. Right, right. Yeah. And, and you know, for me, indifference, I would rather go, I would rather scoop ice cream for a job than do uh -huh. this much work for collective indifference yeah. or a lack of impact. So if I know I'm making an impact to the planet and people are indifferent, I would still do it. But remember, part of our goal with the Cora Ball was to actually inspire people. It wasn't just to like on the down low protect the planet. It very much <laughs> was the opposite of that. It was on the like out loud to cool protect kids, the cool kids only. So <laughs> yeah. so uh so yeah, so thanks for letting me kind of weave this into our discussion. Um, yeah, I've got some info amazing. there. Yeah, Rachel, I, I've learned so much from you. I really appreciate your time. Um, I just want to, uh, for those more auditorily oriented than visually, um, can you just say your, um, your contacts uh, info at coraball.com? That was one. And then what's the yeah, best no. place for people to find you on social media? Yeah, the best place to find us, just email best. There's more people answering info at coraball.com, C-O-R-A, Cora Ball. And our Instagram, which is where we're most active, is at the Cora Ball. That is amazing. All right. Well, with those final words of wisdom and uh, the audience knows where to reach you, Rachel, I just want to say thank you one more time. I am super inspired. I had so much fun chatting with you and uh, we'll say goodbye to everybody for, for now. And hopefully we'll have you back on the show with, with more data, more learnings and more so. uh, updated uh, version of your beautiful mission. I hope so. I learned so much from you as well and, uh, and really appreciate the chance to chat. So thank awesome. you so much. All right, well, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Bye.